Hi, my name is Julie Stigmeyer, and I work at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University. Um, in writing support, we often share resources with students, including information on APA formatting and incorporating research. And that's what I'll be sharing with you today. First of all, when we think about incorporating research, we can look at three different subtopics, in-text citations and references, paraphrasing versus quoting, and substantiating claims. Whenever you paraphrase or quote, make sure that you include a one-to-one -one correspondence between your in-text in citations, where you show the abbreviated version of a source, usually just the author's last name and the year. And then in your references, you show the full version of the source listed out. So you must have this one-to-one -one correspondence where all of the citations you use in your text appear as full references on your reference page and vice versa. In terms of paraphrasing versus quoting, um, a paraphrase is something that you where you in, integrate research by restating original text in your own words and adding the correct citation. In general, it's preferred at the graduate level that you paraphrase. If you include quotations, a suggestion would be to have no more than five words strung together in a quotation. So try to avoid as much as you can uh, quotations, but and, and really rely on paraphrasing because it gives you more flexibility to compare and contrast um, and to summarize and synthesize. And generally at the master's level, you will avoid block quotes of 40 plus words completely. So how do you paraphrase? Here are some tips to help you. First, read and fully understand the original. Um, it's very difficult to paraphrase something when you don't understand all the nuances of what the author is trying to say. So really dive deep into understanding that. Another suggestion that can help you avoid plagiarism or text that is too similar to the original is to paraphrase longer sections like a paragraph instead of a single sentence. And if you're trying to do that one-to-one, -one, you know, creating synonyms, uh, that can create something called patch writing, where it's really too similar to the original. So instead, if you can paraphrase longer sections, that often will help you avoid that problem. Another tip, if you are working on paraphrasing only a single sentence, is to flip the sentence around. What I mean by that is to change the grammar of the sentence so the, the subject in the original sentence becomes the object or is placed toward the end of the paraphrased sentence and vice versa. And then, like I mentioned, patch writing is swapping out a couple of words from the original with synonyms. Instead, find a completely new way of saying the same thing. The last thing I'd like to talk about as I'm briefly introducing some principles for incorporating research into your writing is the idea of substantiation. Substantiation refers to adding credible research to claims. This means that every time a fact, statistic, or finding is mentioned in your writing, a citation must be added. This provides credibility to your work. So this is an example of a paragraph that um, has no citations, and I've numbered the sentences so that you can think about which ones might need substantiation. At this point in the recording, if you'd like to pause and read the paragraph and think about this yourself, this might be a good time to do that. In this paragraph, I would suggest citing all the sentences for two through six. The first sentence, chronic stress has physical and mental health consequences, 
is it could also be cited. However, it is um, broad enough and uh, that it could be considered common knowledge. So a lot of times when you're thinking about what to cite and what not to cite, the question is, who knows this information? Um, and how specific does it get? So the first sentence is basically stress, stress has physical and mental health consequences. Well, that's so broad that it could maybe be argued that you don't need to cite that sentence. However, <clears throat> as you can see with this paragraph, sentences two through six all have very specific terminology and make very specific claims. So number two, allostatic load involves the brain and accumulated strain of chronic stress. So when you have specific jargon or language like this, it's going to need a citation. And it goes on describing all of these very specific neurological features in um, stress in ad among adolescents. So that's kind of the general idea of substantiation is making sure that every sentence that has a claim, a fact, a statistic, or a finding is cited. But I want to show you two options that often works with citations in a paragraph like this. So here's the same paragraph and I added some citations here. This would be an appropriate level of substantiation for something like a literature review, where you are reading multiple sources and then paraphrasing those sources and synthesizing them, pulling them into a new paragraph. Um, and so you can see here, each one has a slightly different, uh, or refers to different uh, sources. This one, as a matter of fact, is a multiple citation. So what that means is that the information in this sentence appeared in both of these sources. So this is one way that, that this, might substantiate, this might show substantiation. But I also want to show you this example. This is also very common among student writers or even in professional writing where a paragraph is a long paraphrase. So what that means is that this source was accessed and every single one of these sentences is paraphrased from this source, but because of um, the citation rule in APA, you only need to include that source in the first mention and then it's assumed that unless you change sources, um, you can, you don't have to uh, keep citing that throughout the paragraph. What APA considers over-citation would be including this same citation at the end of every single one of these sentences. However, I find that students often prefer to over-cite as opposed to under-citing, which would be the very first example I showed you where there were no citations. So those are some of the principles and thoughts that you can consider as you are providing substantiation for your work. So I'd like to go on now and talk about the manuscript elements that are required for APA documents. These are all of the manuscript elements within APA, but typically for student papers, you only need the title page, text, and references. So I'll just go through some of those requirements in the next few slides. This is a screenshot of the top half of a title page. On this um, title page, you have the page number in the top right, no running head up here. Then you space down a little bit, put your title in title case and bold and centered. There's a blank line here. Then you have your name, your school, um, your course and the course name, your professor's name and the date. And notice that all of this is in double spacing. The whole APA document is double spaced. There are just a few extra blank lines on the title page, including one here between the title and your name. 
So let's talk about the text. There are a number of things to consider when you begin your text, which usually starts on page two. You continue with the page number in the top right. You add the title a second time, centered, bolded, and in title case. And then you can see that this is all double spaced and there's first line indentation for each of the paragraphs. Also, you always have one inch margins with APA formatting. And that's usually the default on Google Docs or Microsoft Word. Another feature of the text is regarding levels of headings. Um, levels of using headings is actually quite helpful in your document to designate sections or you know, identify sections where the information is broken down in your work. And there are multiple levels of headings. In APA, there are five, as a matter of fact. Typically, I st see students use two or three levels of headings in longer papers, maybe 10 or 15 pages. Um, and I just want to show you how this works because it's really helpful for you to see the organization of your paper kind of at a glance. And it also helps your professor or reader to understand the basic thrust of your, your sections in your paper. So this is a level one heading that's centered, bolded, and in title case. And this shows that this is going to be a major section of the paper. And then within that big section, there are two level two headings. They are flush left, centered, oh sorry, flush left, bolded, and, and uh, in title case. So then there are these two sections that are subsections of the guided imagery. And you can go on to level three, which it would be a breakdown of a level two section. And that would be bold, italics, and title case. But typically, I see students use levels one and two. So let's talk a little bit about in-text citation. Whenever you're including that research in your work, there are two options for including in-text citations, narrative and parenthetical. So narrative citations refer to the authors within the sentence itself. So here you can see Williams is the subject of the sentence. And after the name, the author's name, there's an interruption with the parenthetical, um, a parenthetical citation showing the year. So this is one author, two authors, and three or more. And this is how they appear. So these are actually part of the sentences themselves. Whereas down here, you can see that the sentence is just a paraphrase. And there is no reference to the name of the author within the words of the sentence. So then what you do is you put parentheses at the end and add the author's last name and the year. So this is what it looks like for one author. This is for two authors. And notice the difference here with a narrative um, citation with two authors, you spell out the word and with a parenthetical citation with two authors, you use an ampersand. But with both of them from the very first time you mention this source, if there are three or more authors, you use the last name of the first author and this Latin abbreviation et al. And you just spell it ET space AL period. And it looks the same down here. It's just within that parenthetical citation. So these are the two options you have to choose from within text citations. Um, and these are for paraphrases. If you include <clears throat> a specific part of the source, you might be in your professor might ask you to include a chapter number or <clears throat> a page number. So whenever you use a quotation, you must include also that page number. The last section we're going to talk about are the references. 
And this is a screenshot of part of a reference page. You can see up here at the top, the page number continues. The word references is centered and in bold. Everything is continued to be double spaced. Um, instead of that first line indentation, we actually have hanging indent, which means that the first line of the new reference is on is flush left, and then any following lines are indented. You include the authors, the sources in the order of alphabetical by the last name. Um, and then the just one other quick note is that you do include hyperlinks um, for DOI addresses or URLs. So that's kind of the basic structure, alphabetical order by last name of the author, hanging indent, double spaced, DOI addresses are hyperlinked. These are three examples of journal article references. And I want to point out a couple of things here. Notice um, how these authors appear. You have last name, first initial, and it's kind of fussy. So you have last name, comma, space, first initial, period, comma, space, and then you go on to the next one. If you have multiple initials, like this one is a first initial and a middle initial, you put the author's last name, comma, space, the first initial period, space, second initial or middle initial period, and then a comma, and you go on. So that's how you, you work with the authors. You list them all, and before the last one, you use that ampersand. So these all follow that pattern. Here's how it looks with just one. And then you include the year. So this is the who, this is the when, the article title is the what, and then where is where you found it. Here's the journal name, the volume, issue, page range, and DOI. So with the year, all these are the same. You just put them in parentheses with a period after. Article titles have, um, sentence case capitalization. That means that you only capitalize the first word of the title, um, the first word of a subtitle, like down here, and then any proper nouns. So that could be a country name or, you know, any like Adlerian theory, anything that is a proper noun. So those, the, the title, for articles is often a capital, kind of a capitalization challenge because you have to put those in lower case, except for the first word of the title, first word of the subtitle, and proper nouns. The journal names are in title case, so that means that every important word is capitalized. You can see in this one, you don't capitalize the of. Then comes the volume number after a comma. It's also in italics. Then no space, but non-italic, regular font. You put parentheses and the issue number in there. Then a comma. Then the page range. A period. And then the DOI address hyperlinked. And just a little fussy detail, you'll notice here, this is how you present the DOIs. HTTPS colon slash slash DOI.org and then the, the numeral that usually starts with 10. Sometimes if you copy this from the library database, it'll just be like um, DOI all caps colon and then the number or it'll show some other kind of URL with your school's name within the DOI address. But all you need to do is take all of that out and just put this as your opening and then this as your numeral and then make sure that it you click on it and it actually goes to that link. 
So those are journal articles. For books, they're a little more straightforward. So if you're including textbooks in your references, they might look like this. Here's a book with one author, similar formatting for the author and year. For book titles, it's very similar to article titles, although it is italicized. So you only capitalize the first word of the title, the first word of the subtitle, and any proper nouns. And then the last thing you put is the publisher. So those are pretty straightforward and easy. There are other, the, the main thing about references to keep in mind is that for every different type of content, like TED Talk, YouTube video, PowerPoint slide, a book, journal, for every single different type of content, you set up the reference differently. So it's always good to look at models like this um, for to make sure that you're setting yours up correctly. As a bit of practice, you could stop this, the video here and take a look at this source and try to figure out how you could make sure this is in APA format. This would be the correct way to set up this source. So you notice here the first names are listed in APA. APA format, you only list the initials. So here's the last name, first two initials, last name, first initial. Then you have your title of the article, only the first word is capitalized. Then the journal name with uh, italics and title case, the volume number, the issue, the page range, and that DOI address that is hyperlinked. If you were to refer to these in citations in the paper, they would look like this. Well, thank you for your, your time and um, attention. And um, as always, you can come to GSEP Writing Support for more information or for help with your APA formatting or for your writing. Until next time, happy writing.